Hi, again, my, uh, my name is Bill O'Brien. I'm the Senior Advisor for Program Innovation for the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, very delighted to have two terrific panelists here with us today to address the question of who gets to imagine for the human race, which uh, I think I felt like we drew the long straw and had the, in some ways, the most compelling question. <laughs> um, I have with me over at the end Tom Khalil. Uh, Tom is the Deputy Director for Technology and Innovation, Technology and Innovation Division at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. And then right here to my left is Lori Silvers. Uh, Lori, along with her husband, Mitchell Rubenstein, uh, were founders of the Sci-Fi Channel, and uh, she served as its CEO for many of its formative years. Um, she's also the founder of Hollywood Media and has served as its vice chairman, president, and secretary since its inception. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really, really engaged and, and um, uh, curious about how this question um, will be unpacked throughout the next 45 minutes or so. Um, but I just gave uh, both of our panelists a, a, a little bit of warning that the first question I'm going to ask is, is going to twist this a little bit and really bring it into a more personal realm. Um, it, it seems to me that um, the future is largely going to be driven by people who are not necessarily just following a set career path, but are rather uh, driven by um, a set of passions or answering a, a certain internal call. And um, so I just wanted to ask both of you, we'll start with you, Tom, on um, how did you, just on a personal level, uh, imagine your way to this sort of odd uh, path that you've taken um, from practicing law through the Carter administration and where you are today? Um, <laughs> Must uh, be thinking of someone else. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, so uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background. So I've, ha I've had the opportunity to work at the White House for 14 years now, uh, eight years uh, uh, under President Clinton. Uh, as we say, during those dark days of peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, and now uh, six years, uh, coming up on six years for uh, President Obama. Um, and uh, what I find endlessly fascinating about the work that I get to do is that on a good day, I get to serve as a policy entrepreneur. That is to talk to lots of smart people, both inside and outside the government, who have a really interesting and important idea uh, and then to figure out how to build a coalition around that. So in the late 90s, for example, I s began talking to researchers in physics and chemistry and engineering who had this idea uh, about nanoscale science and engineering, which is that, um, uh, that at the nanoscale, uh, not only were things smaller, but they had new properties, and that this would be the equivalent of adding another dimension to the periodic table of elements. And if we had the ability to not only understand those properties, but to harness them, we might be able to do things like uh, store the equivalent of the Library of Congress in a device the size of a sugar cube, make materials that are stronger than steel in a fraction of the weight, uh, and d uh, develop smart anti-cancer therapeutics that would deliver drugs only to tumors while leaving healthy cells untouched. Um, and so we presented this to President Clinton as, as uh, one of his uh, options. Uh, and he got excited about this, went to Caltech and gave a whole speech about it. Uh, when we started, the federal government was investing $270 million a year, uh, and now it's investing $1.5 uh, billion a year. And as a result, uh, all these new uh, products are beginning to uh, emerge from that that will help address uh, major economic and societal challenges in areas like health and energy and information technology. So, uh, what is uh, fun about my role is that uh, I have the ability to interact with lots of people inside and outside the government, and then some fraction of the time uh, build the coalition that is necessary to take that idea from uh, something that you know a small group of scientists and engineers are thinking about to something that is on the national and global agenda by virtue of the President of the United States talking about it. Right. So it's a, it's a great position to make things translatable in a way. Uh, so Lori, um, you, um, you and your husband sort of thought this idea of, of there needing to be a, a sci-fi channel. Um, and just tell us a little bit about um, what drove you from, from that kind of uh, platform to establishing uh, Hollywood.com, Broadway.com. 
Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, my, I'm, an, I'm a business entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, which is not a hotbed. It's not Silicon Valley. It's not New York. It's, it's not a hotbed of um, entrepreneur ideas, although there are a lot more there than you would, than you would think. But uh, the concept of creating and dreaming big dreams has always been something that I've wanted to do, I long to do. I'm a lawyer by background, and I think that training has given me a, a wonderful ability to look at um, ideas and concepts and kind of hone in on what the issues are. So early on in my career as a lawyer, I was representing a lot of people that were in the media entertainment business. Um, and to be a good lawyer, you have to become a student of what your client is doing. I became a student of that world. And I fell in love with it. It was love at, at first um, lawsuit. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I decided that I wanted to um, make the shift from being a lawyer and representing to actually being um, a business person and owning. Um, and it was, it was a big shift because it's one thing to bill your client for hours and then go home and not worry about it anymore. And it's another to own a business and have to worry about payroll and growth and you know, funding and, and all the good things that go along with being in business as an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. the translation of that is how to get money on a grassroots level where nobody wants to finance what you're dreaming of. So that's really what an entrepreneur is. Um, I wish I had the President of the United States you know, at my back, but that <laughs> isn't always the case. So you've got, you've got quite the luxury. Uh, and uh, for, just for years, uh, owning radio and tape, uh, television and cable and understanding the industry, and then at one point saying, I really want to make the giant leap. I want to own a cable network. What, what's not out there? So this was back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I, the, the term channel locked isn't relevant anymore, but it was back then. There were 64 uh, channels. Uh, that you got through your cable operator, and every cable operator was, was full. So to come up with a new idea, you had to not only come up with a new idea, uh, get the funding, get the contract for carriage, you had to get cable operators to kick off an existing channel, which was, that was mighty hard. Mm -hmm. um, so it had to be a, a channel that would um, be compelling and that the, ch the cable operator understood that there would be a huge audience for, and the, the concept of science fiction programming, 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week, was a big idea. And uh, you know, the minute that we announced it, um, it, it just sort of took off. And I had to put on my running shoes to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an audience for it. The cable operators understood it. Uh, oh, believe me, there were a lot of issues along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a great idea. And look where it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, my husband and I are the, the co-founders, owned it and ran it for a period of time. We've, we've since sold it, um, and it is uh, enormously successful. And it's enormously successful because science fiction is great writing. It's great entertainment. So it, it appeals to such a vast audience, not only um, like the folks in this room who understand and create great storytelling, but to the audience that, that is, is hungry for that. Um, so a wonderful experience in my life. And I've gone on to create other things. And, and my, uh, my sensibility is to grab onto an idea that will change the landscape. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is challenging. Um, some have worked and some <laughs> have not. Um, and that's for another story completely. OK. Great. Well, thanks. Um, uh, Tom, I want to go back to you and um, ask you a little bit about um, what to me seems to be some of the most outrageously imagining for the human race projects that are, that are happening right now. Um, out of the White House, there's uh, grand challenges. Mm -hmm. um, the Brain Initiative is among those. Um, and if you uh, could just give us a little sense of what the thinking is from the administration standpoint and, uh, and how you're you know, trying to marshal the, the hive to sort of advance us forward in these things. Sure. Uh, so one of the elements of, of President Obama's innovation strategy is uh, identifying 21st century moonshots. Uh, that is, what are some goals that are uh, ambitious but achievable, that have the potential to get the public excited about science, technology, and innovation? Um, and if we actually pulled it off and achieved them, they would be a, uh, it would be a big deal. Uh, and so we've been talking to uh, 
a number of agencies and, and again, people also outside the government about what are some of these potential uh, 21st century moonshots. Um, and some examples, one that the Department of Energy has embraced is called Sunshot. The goal is to make uh, solar as cheap as coal. Uh, NASA is pursuing a grand challenge uh, to uh, identify all the potentially uh, hazardous asteroids, mm -hmm. uh, which you may not think is a problem that we have to worry about over the next two years, but if you take a slightly longer term perspective and uh, uh, you know, it, it is clear that this is something that is, is not just science fiction, that we do have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in April 2013, President Obama uh, announced a grand challenge to dramatically increase our understanding of how uh, human brains work by being able to uh, study the brain in action. Uh, so the idea that the research community came up with is that we have a missing middle, that right now we can either measure the activity of a very small number of neurons, uh, or we can take a fuzzy picture of your entire brain. Uh, but we can't uh, record in real time the activity of entire neural circuits. So that's an example where, in the same way that the scientific revolution really didn't get going until we had mm -hmm. telescopes and microscopes, there are areas where we don't have the tools to really understand how the brain works. Um, and so not only are uh, NIH and DARPA and the National Science Foundation uh, making investments, but we are b helping to build a broad coalition of companies, of research universities, of foundations, of scientific societies that are also, also making a really important contribution towards achieving this goal uh, because we think that this is going to require an all-hands-on-deck effort. Mm -hmm. The thing I'm excited about with respect to grand challenges is that it's not just about governments. Uh, so let me give you one example of, that goes to the, the question of the panel, which is who gets to imagine for the human race. So the National Academy of Engineering uh, worked with the universities to create a grand challenge scholars program. Uh, and so they are now allowing undergraduates to organize their coursework, their research, uh, their international experience, and their service learning around one of these grand challenges. And when uh, it is, ver I think I would challenge even the most hardened cynic uh, <laughs> and the biggest pessimist to interact with these students and not come away uh, feeling, uh, you know, optimistic and, and uh, 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 ab about the human race because uh, they, they're taking with the, these big ideas and they're, and they're running with them. So just um, to, to follow up on the Brain Initiative for a second, um, if you could, from where you're sitting, being very familiar with um, uh, what some of the goals are and, and what some of sure. the potential might be, what, if you were able to dream that in 2024, uh, what, were some of the, what are some of the outcomes that you think might, might take place? One is uh, really about just improved fundamental understanding. So there's just so many questions uh, where we don't know what's going on as the president said, uh, with the you know th three pound mass between our ears. Mm -hmm. So there's an important element of this, which is just like, there are so many things we don't know about how the brain works, and hopefully we'll, we'll have tools that will allow researchers to ask and answer new types of questions about how the brain works and how that leads to behavior and cognition. The second is that uh, our hope is that these new tools will also eventually lead to clinical benefits that will have an improved ability to diagnose, treat, prevent, and cure diseases of the brain, whether it's TBI or PTSD, uh, which is a high priority for the president, or uh, Alzheimer's, uh, which already costs the United States $200 billion and is heading towards a trillion dollars. So you know, if you think that research is expensive, you should try not doing things. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the third thing is that uh, we think that advances in understanding of how the brain works will also have technological benefits. So people are already starting to think about uh, neuromorphic computing. Um, the types of supercomputers that uh, government agencies are thinking about uh, building, if we did nothing today, would eventually require their own dedicated power plant. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, our brain, which has 80 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses, only uses 100 watts. Uh, you know, engineers are in awe of that. and so. That's why you're seeing the emergence of this new field called a neuromorphic computing. So those are uh, the three hopes and dreams of the administration, 
the research community and patient advocacy organizations. Right. Cool. Um, so, Lori, last night uh, we had a little bit of a conversation just to sort of um, prepare for the panel, and you were, I have to say, very modest in, uh, in imagining that from media it might not be as uh, powerful or as impressive as, as Tom and his, uh, his role, even though he didn't practice law. Um, <laughs> but um, I have to say, I, I think media really does have a, a huge impact on, on society and on the way that our thinking shifts. Um, I was thinking after our conversation that that running joke on Seinfeld on, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, probably had as much if not more to do with shifting perceptions on tolerance for sexual preference as, as any advocacy uh, fight might have had. Um, and I think for me, the, the establishment of the Sci-Fi Network just created such an opportunity for people to geek out, you know, on uh, on their, t uh, you know, with their remote on things like Dark Shadows and Doctor Who. Uh, I'm sure there's many fans of both of those shows here. Are there um, any Whovians in the room? Any? <laughs> <laughs> Thank How you. How about uh, Dark Shadows? Okay. Oh, no, very cool. Much. Uh, I thought cool I saw group. some people dressed as Barnabas Collins. <laughs> But uh, I wanted to uh, actually just get into a little bit of gossip maybe in the beginning of this on um, how, did you, how did you create the ability to, to um, secure these properties um, and for Dark Shadows or Doctor Who um, because uh, they existed long before you were able to come and, and provide a syndicate platform for them. Uh, well, a little bit of history is with the very, very first thing that I realized when, and I, and I will answer your question, but it's kind mm -hmm. of a, a long path to get there. I realized when I, when the announcement was made that these entrepreneurs from Boca Raton, who were they, were going to be launching the Sci-Fi Channel, mm -hmm. um, the, the first thing that I, I realized that there was this enormous fan base out there that had to be addressed. And I couldn't walk into a room and make a presentation and pretend to know everything about science, fiction, writing, um, and literature, and, and uh, filmmaking that had gone on in, in previous years. So I, I kind of honed in on somebody that I thought could give me some gravitas if I had to go to those meetings, and that was Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. And Isaac, um, at the time, I'm assuming everyone here knows who <laughs> Isaac Asimov is, OK? It's so disheartening if I, if I go and speak to a younger audience. Mm. Not that we're all not young. Um, <laughs> and they look at me like, and I say, robots? Does anybody know robots around here? <laughs> anyway, so um, I went to Isaac, and I, I told him what the idea was. And he was just this delicious genius who got it. And he said, you know, speaking of humble, he <laughs> said, nobody, not that many people know who I am. Mm. My God, you're Isaac Asimov. Not that many people know who I am. Um, because they don't read, but they watch TV, uh, and they go to the movies, but they watch TV. And I will be, I'll be associated with this, and I will help you, because I want to be able to touch the younger generation and get them interested in space exploration, mathematics, and all the things that are kind of, um, you know, the touch phrases. But he really believed that, and that was the reason why he... He did become a member of our board of advisors, and he, boy, did he advise. And he was terrific. And then going on with his, nobody knows who I am, but I have a friend that is very successful in, in this uh, world of uh, television and filmmaking, and that friend is Gene Roddenberry. And we all know Gene Roddenberry, right? <laughs> this is such a cool group. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and so he picked up the phone, and, and um, he, co he had collaborated with Gene many times uh, during the course of the Star Trek television series. and But just because he was a friend and he never asked for uh, payment, he picked up the phone. He said, I'm going to ask for a favor. I want you to meet Lori and uh, her husband, Mitchell. They're going to come out, um, and you're going to meet them, and, and you're going to be on their board of advisors. So it was kind of neat going to, <laughs> right, I already knew the, the answer was going to be yes. Um, and having those, two, um, having those two icons and geniuses um, mm. help along the way was uh, enormously, enormously powerful uh, to to help get mm -hmm. this where it needed to be, and it was and it really was a puzzle. You know, how do you go from a what I thought was a great, compelling idea, and turned out it was, to actually launching a cable, a national cable network? How do you do that without the help of not not only not the president, but not you know <laughs> Time Warner, Viacom, mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, Turner, how do you do it without being part of one of the major media companies? And it was, and as I said, it was a puzzle. It was just putting all the pieces. It was getting the programming. Mm -hmm. How did I get the programming? Well, ultimately, it was getting the meeting so that I could just, you know, make my case. And um, a one time, I found out the person I was meeting with was a huge fan of Isaac Asimov. And Isaac <laughs> wasn't able to go to the meeting. But I got him to sign like 20 books, you know, uh, and each one had like a different phrase in it. And I, I came with my books, and then I made the presentation, and yeah, that was successful. I got what I wanted. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it was, it, was, um, it was getting the meetings, it was sitting there, it was being uh, knowledgeable about how this was a great business. It's the world of science fiction is a great business. And that's how I sold it to the cable operators. I sold, but it was equally as important was selling it to the science fiction fan community, mm -hmm. the Whovians, the the, <laughs> the, start, the dark shadows, but uh, and and the, the the writers and the readers because they supported it. And like anything else, you need the support underlying uh, the concept. So it was that, and of course, at the end of the day, writing a big check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Um, I, uh, I'm a, a little bit leery of doing this because I'm a huge fan uh, of Neil Stevenson's. And last night I heard he's from Iowa, which even raises him higher in my book. Um, but something did come up last night that he echoed today that I was thinking about last night, this notion that big innovation comes out of gigantic institutions. Um, and I think, I, I wonder if like frogs in the pot, if that had been true in the past, certainly with, you know, in places like DARPA and innovation labs at places like IBM and Skunk Works. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels like uh, in our conversations, for example, at the National Science Foundation, that there's a, there's a really big disruption going on in terms of who gets to imagine and participate in this stuff. So if you think of citizen science, uh, yep. citizen journalism, um, I think with 3D printing and 3D textile printing, the, the idea of citizen industrialists. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it's if you think about it, it's kind of been going on for a while. Facebook and, and Apple and Etsy and even Microsoft mostly started out with a couple of guys in a bedroom or a, a garage. So one of the questions, and certainly media, you know, who gets to, who gets to be controlling or creating content is all over the map, this whole pro-am sort of thing. I mentioned last night my son has a, a YouTube channel. Right. <laughs> he has 400 you know, views on one of his uh, videos, which is not the 100 million households of uh, well, sci-fi channel. Good for to start somewhere. Right, but still, there's, there's an enormous amount of um, energy and uh, I, I think in, in some ways a drive to participate that is happening outside of the gatekeeping that used to happen in a lot of different sectors. So um, would love for each of you to think about how those kinds of energies are considered and thought about. Um, in, in, for example, the grand challenges and in the future of media, which I'm, I'm sure uh, you know, nobody has the answer to, but, um, but just in terms of how you think that might be heading. But let's just start with the, the White House. Sure. Uh, so one of the reasons that President Obama decided to have the first ever uh, White House Maker Fair mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, we really do think that the maker movement is a way of democratizing the ability to imagine and design and prototype and make just about anything. So in the same way that uh, cloud computing uh, has lowered the cost of doing an internet startup uh, from millions of dollars to thousands of dollars, and that allows more people who have a new idea for an online service, we're beginning to see some of the uh, similar phenomena occur not only in the world of bits, but in the world of atoms. So. Um, the, a situation where for the cost of a gym membership, you could get access to a tech shop, uh, a mil get access to a million dollars worth of machine tools, learn how to use a laser cutter, a water jet that can cut through four inches of steel, um, participate with your peers and, and get help from them. Then if you have a, a really interesting idea, you might be able to uh, uh, launch a uh, crowdfunding campaign on a Kickstarter or, or an Indiegogo. Um, and then we've already seen a number of instances where uh, something will go from, you know, an, an, an idea to uh, a prototype coming out of a fab lab or a makerspace or, or tech mm -hmm. shop. Uh, but I think, you know, 
large uh, organizations continue to play an important role. Um, uh, and, and as you said, there are lots of organizations that start off small and become big. Uh, so you have individuals like uh, Elon Musk who said, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact. Uh, <laughs> uh, achieving that goal, uh, you know, you're not going to do out of your garage, right? And so he has had to mobilize the financial and human resources, uh, partnering with uh, NASA uh, uh, to build a, a rocket that is capable of going up to the International S uh, Space Station uh, delivering and uh, and retrieving cargo, and now along with Boeing, uh, astronauts, uh, so that U.S. astronauts can be getting rides on on U.S. rockets. Uh, but you know his long-term vision is to make uh, you know humanity a, a multi-planetary species, and I, I would like to see uh, more individuals and organizations with that level of uh, audacity and and long-term vision. Right. So in some ways, it's sort of like having your cake and eating it too on the um, gigantic institution. I suppose you could say the White House and policy setting is one, but engaging with sort of the, the crowd in, in a way. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, one mechanism for us to do that is uh, OSTP worked with Congress to pass legislation that gives every agency the ability to support incentive prizes mm -hmm. for up to $50 million. And so that allows the government to set a goal while being agnostic about uh, what team is most likely to be successful, what is the best approach. Uh, and I think in general, a government that is stronger on the what and more flexible on the how uh, is going to be able to get a lot more novel ideas from uh, distributed communities of innovators. Great. And just very quickly, the, um, we're going to go to questions in just a minute. but. Um, any thoughts on uh, the future of media, where, where we're going next? And well, I have all the answers, but I'm not going to. You'll have to write them. Intellectual first. property. Right, right, right. No, <laughs> it's I, expensive. I'm, I'm, see, I'm, I believe that everything has a place. And I'm an entrepreneur, so dreaming and uh, believing that you can create what's, what doesn't create and then figuring out all the pieces to make that puzzle happen. To me, it's, it's like lifeblood. And I, I think as long as every... As, as long as our culture, our society, um, s makes sure that there's a f playing field out there for everybody, for the, for the big corporations to do their thing, for government to do their thing with their wonderful array of resources, but for the individual to feel, whether it's your son who mm -hmm. has the 400 subscribers on, on YouTube uh, as an outlet for what he's creating, but just as long as that entrepreneurial spirit uh, continues to, le to live on and be nurtured, which it is. So, I mean, like crowdfunding and all these places that you can go to to, to give yourself the ability to, to move forward on your ideas and your dreams. I think that we all can, can imagine the future. It's much easier today than it was back when I was imagining the Sci-Fi Channel. So I think that's the, uh, and this is kind of the loop from the first question. Um, the, the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Science Foundation and Endowment for Humanities has been in conversations for about a year on how um, we can try to uh, invest in intelligent ways and in all these energies happening at the intersections. And one of the things that seems to be coming up a lot for all of us, and I just got back uh, from the European Union conversation where they were concerned about the same things, the idea of broadening participation so that in these emerging economies, um, trying to create opportunities for everyone to have the sense of uh, the term that's often used, agency. So people mm -hmm. imagine themselves actually participating. When you don't allow enough people to participate in imagining for the human race, you cause trouble. I mean, revolutions happen when, when uh, Arab Springs happen, uh, when that doesn't uh, uh, take place. So I think the Maker Faire obviously is one way mm -hmm. that the White House is doing that. And um, the, the sort of democratization of content creation um, is certainly an, another one. Um, but Anyway, uh, quick hand for my panelists, and we're going to get to questions. We'll have about 10 minutes, I think. OK. Questions? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. I'm from Europe. I'm born in one country, living uh, in Norway and uh, French national. I've been working a few years with European Commission. Uh -huh. My question is, which countries in the world you would like to have partners in what you are doing. 
Europe has a new government now. Mm -hmm. What you said is right. Mm -hmm. And we face probably differently, but the same serious problem, democratization, mobilization, awareness, and we have blocks, homogeneous blocks in Europe, difficult to penetrate, you know, I think very well. So I did some work also in China and Japan. Would you like, I mean, would you, in your policy, the president and others, uh, I, I can't promise you the moon, but I have those organizations behind me. Uh, and I can start tomorrow if I can be provocative in America. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, it's a, a great question. And, uh, you know, science and, and research is inherently a global enterprise. And I think the only question is, uh, does it make sense to have, uh, you know, sort of formal, MOUs between governments, or does it make sense to sort of en enable more grassroots and, and bottom-up scientific collaboration? And you know, my experience has been that uh, that these collaborations are are already occurring in a number of the areas that, that are that are priorities for the administration. So I, I don't think the question is should we collaborate. I think the question is should it be driven by the researchers themselves, uh, or is there a and, and what role is there for the government to, to facilitate these collaborations? Um, well, I'd just say from the, from the European Commission meetings that I was just in, it was kind of funny for a second because they asked me to come and respond to a report that they did that was similar to one we did with NSF a while ago on creativity and innovation, innovation to advance productivity um, and competitiveness. <laughs> and there was one uh, point in the, in the report that I noticed that it said there's a sense of urgency in Europe so that they could compete better with China and the United States. Um, so I wasn't sure if I should give them bad information to send them <laughs> down the wrong path. Um, but I think what we ended up with uh, is really, I think, a, a useful exchange, especially in recognizing the need to let everybody participate in these emerging e economies. That ends up serving everybody. Um, uh, that, that addresses things like social unrest and, and healthy societies. So there can be, I think, a very interesting way of, of creating a, a healthy co-opetition where we're providing information exchanges back and forth so that, um, that, that we actually do this in a wise way, not just a smart and productive and, and profitable way. So uh, one area where I'm really excited about global uh, collaboration is is working together to help address some of the challenges of developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, so, how many of you know who James Grant was? Anyone know who James Grant was? Who is James Grant? James Grant was a a, a Kennedy uh, administration thinker about and and creator of the U.S. International for Agency for International Development. So, uh, he was in he served as the head of UNICEF. Uh, and under his watch, uh, he basically browbeat the countries of the world to focus on child survival. And when he got started, 14 million children under the age of five were dying every year, uh, primarily from uh, easily treatable and preventable diseases. Uh, and that is now down, uh, because of his efforts and the efforts of many other people, it is now down to 6.3 million. So it's still unconscionably high, mm -hmm. but as a result of uh, things like vaccines and oral rehydration therapy uh, and new drugs uh, and improving the public health systems in, in developing countries, there really has been a revolution in child survival. And uh, child survival is continuing to prove now at a rate of 4% uh, per year. Um, so uh, thinking about what's after the Millennium Development Goals and, and how uh, uh, countries with lots of know-how in science, technology, and innovation can help address those uh, is, I, I think, a ripe area of collaboration between the United States and Europe. Next question. Yes. Uh, my question is to Tom. Um, uh, to what extent um, should the federal government be involved in imagining the future? And to what extent is it a problem that we farm these envisionings out to events like this today? So 30 or 40 years ago, we had the Office of Technology Assessment in the Congressional Clearinghouse in the future. And they would convene events mm -hmm. like what yep. we're having here. 
Um, I worked at the Congressional Clearinghouse in the year that uh, Representative Gore envisioned the information superhighway. <laughs> <laughs> so we're having events like, like this here. Right. Uh, uh, but now there's a consensus that we don't want the government involved really in doing that type of thing. And it's good to have think tanks and academic institutions do it. They can do a better job. But is anything lost in terms of, let's say, the lack of engineering sophistication and scale, some of the issues that related here when you have think tanks and whatnot address these issues. I mean, the OTA had a scale that's unimaginable for a, a think tank or even an academic institution in addressing many of these uh, institutions. And yet I think there's a consensus that this is the best way to, to have these type of conversations almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, the, so the federal government is investing $135 billion a year in research and development. And if that isn't about, uh, you know, fundamentally imagining the future, I, I don't know what is. So that, that process is going on all the time, uh, but I don't think it's a process that should just be happening internally within the government. I think it should be happening uh, broadly uh, within uh, our, our economy and our society. Let me just give you one example of an idea that has uh, bubbled up from NASA engineers uh, that I am particularly excited about. They wrote uh, a paper called Bootstrapping a Solar System Civilization. Uh, and their idea was the reason that space is expensive is that right now all of the matter and energy that we uh, use in space comes from Earth. What would it look like? Uh, uh, and Cory Doctorow's chapter was a, a baby step in this direction. But what would it look like for the entire, the, the entire supply chain needed to support an interplanetary civilization uh, to use the matter and energy uh, from space? And, you know, I just think that is a phenomenally inspiring, um, you know, long-term vision that we could begin to be taking uh, steps towards uh, uh, achieving right now. Great. Uh, one more question uh, right here. Your mic is coming to you. Hi, my name is Vandana Singh, and I have several questions, but I'll try to restrain myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a um, couple of things. Um, one is the issue of global collaboration uh, and helping developing countries. Um, before I actually ask the question, I want to just uh, make clear my discomfort with the term developing country because of the fact that it assumes, among other things, only one path to development. And we know that the world uh, development machine is basically trashing the livability of the planet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but one of the things I was wondering about is whether anybody has thought of a non-top-down approach to global assistance, which is to collaborate with people there, with communities, um, to see what they want and to find technologies uh, appropriate to them. Because in a sense, if you think about it, uh, I think, for instance, that it's rude to, say, push your religion on somebody. Um, but uh, we push a certain model of development and economics on other societies and cultures without asking what it is that's important to them. I know of at least one engineering school in the US that has that approach of actually going to communities and seeing what they want and then trying to come up with satisfying their needs. Uh, so that was one thing I was wondering about. And if I may also, um, as somebody who is a college professor, comment on, uh, is there a grand challenge on science literacy? Because it seems like an impossible thing to, to imagine to have the richest country in the world have really low levels of science literacy there. And uh, also that, uh, you know, where do you see citizen science play a role in my science fiction writing? One of the things I'm interested in is technology that enables citizen science. And then whether in the, in the science literacy mix, we can throw in issues of race and gender in the sciences, yep. uh, which is a cultural problem as well. And so the media has a really important role to play. After all, for instance, the sci-fi channel is not just about money or even just about dreams. Uh, it's about truth, like all media should be about truth, right, uh, at some level. And uh, it's true that women can do science and do do science. So like, uh, so I guess I'm asking a mixture of questions <laughs> after all, and I apologize for that. But I I'm going to respond to the, the science fiction one. Um, 
so going back to the the creators, and I, and I do I do have to go back to them, um, Isaac and Gene. Uh, Gene was a, a tremendous believer in storytelling, uh, male, female, didn't matter to him. He just was a believer in great storytelling. And one of the reasons that he was so um, excited about it, this 24 hours a day, seven days a week programming of this kind of content was because he looked at it as a laboratory and a place that you could make mistakes. You could bring in new ideas. You could bring in new subject matters. And the, and the marketplace would tell you what was going to be accepted and what was going to be rejected. Mm -hmm. and, but you weren't going to live and die by the sword. If, you, if it didn't work, throw it away and you put something else up. And that was, to him, that was a, a great luxury to be able to create basically without the boundaries of the, the, the suits of the networks, going back into the, the days when you know, we're talking about. Um, and while it's a for-profit enterprise, so there's no question about that, uh, the fact that um, not everything has to work doesn't mean it will be, um, you know, it will go down the tubes. And that, just to expand on that just a little bit, is, uh, is an enormous freedom to have the ability, the right, to think outside the, the boundaries, to think things that, you know, may not be acceptable to most of the people, but it's your ability and it's, it's your ability to have the freedom to think in those directions that I think starts to answer the question, who has the right to think for the human race? Right. We all do. Mm -hmm. We all do. And it's great when media can embrace that by creating a, a niche network and et cetera, et cetera. And now, of course, we live in a world of niche networks. Um, but it's, it started with the sci-fi channel, uh, I like to think. Yeah, and I, and, and I, did, I think that you're actually echoing um, some of the things that we were mentioning earlier about broadening participation. That might be uh, absolutely diversity is a big part of that, um, making sure that um, everyone is given, to what extent we can, the type of agency that these, both, these panelists both felt as they imagine themselves in the future and actually participating in the, in the future of the human race. Um, we're supposed to stop, but did you have anything very quick that you wanted to respond to? The <laughs> yes. Uh, let's work together to create more uh, positive, self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Good. Perfect.